Hey there, creatives. I am really excited to uh, launch this next round of bonus episodes uh, for the voices from the Expressive Therapy Summit special series, which we've been bringing to you over the past couple of years. Uh, it highlights uh, interviews that I have with various um, speakers and presenters and workshop facilitators that uh, are affiliated with the Expressive Therapy Summit. Uh, the next handful of episodes that we release will be released as we get them done um, in promotion for the November uh, East Coast event, which will happen virtually, completely online, so you can join from around the world, wherever um, you might be. And uh, our first guest, her name is Mariana Alessandri, and she is an existential philosopher, and she draws on um, a diverse group of 19th and 20th century philosophers to help us see that our suffering is a sign, not that we are broken, but that we are tender, perceptive, and intelligent. So she's really re working to reframe um, the way we you know, stigmatize people for not feeling good. Um, I hope you enjoy this conversation. And uh, if you're interested in hearing more from her, you'll definitely have to check out her presentation at the Expressive Therapy Summit, where she's going to talk about um, going against toxic positivity and embracing sadness for genuine empathy, which will happen on November 16th from 7 to 8 30 p.m eastern time and like i said it will be virtual so you can join from wherever you happen to be on this big planet and without further ado here's our conversation the creative psychotherapist is the official podcast of the creative clinicians corner a practice building resource for creative psychotherapists TCP Podcast is the cast for creative, expressive, and experiential focused psychotherapists curious to learn how to design, build, and scale a thriving private practice. Your host, Raina Lombardi, interviews successful therapists about the tools and strategies they have used to develop creative focused practices. They also talk about the products, services, and side hustles they have developed using their knowledge and creativity to enhance their therapy practices, make a greater impact in their communities and diversify their income streams. Welcome. Now here's your host, Raina Lombardi. Thanks so much for listening to the Creative Psychotherapist podcast. I'm your host, Raina Lombardi, and I'm very excited to welcome my next guest, uh, who is going to be presenting at the November Expressive Therapy Summit. And um, her name is Mariana Alessandri, and she is an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley, and the co-founder of the Rio Grande Valley Parents United for Excellent Dual Education. It's her mission to promote bilingualism, biculturalism at UGTRGV. And she has a new book, Night Vision, Seeing Ourselves Through Dark Moods, which has been published by Princeton Press. And she asked readers to rethink dark moods like anger, sadness, anxiety, grief, and depression. And she's worried about the effects that toxic positivity is having on North Americans. And she asks that we stop focusing on the choose happy mindset and instead challenges us to dim the lights until our eyes adjust to the rich darkness that the human existence offers. So welcome, Mariana. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. Thank you for having me. So let's just jump right in. Um, what Caught, what what like connected you to this calling to um address toxic positivity and highlight 
you know, the benefits of feeling all of the feelings, the full range of emotions that we feel as humans? Um, I think at first it was just the basic fact that I can't stay positive. Mm -hmm. And after years of struggling with it and saying what's wrong with me and reading like 1000 self-help books on how to be more grateful, how to appreciate your life more, how to change your perspective, how to do it all yourself, right? Like, I just realized, like, I can't stay positive and there's nothing wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to carve out a space because I sense that I'm not alone, that I'm not the only person who can't stay positive and who feels broken because of it or who feels like, you know, there's something wrong with us. And so I wanted to go, like, analyze the different moods that I and others experience, like anger and anxiety and, and grief and sadness and depression. and try to understand what it is about those, why they make us feel broken in our world. Like, I think it's super contextual mm -hmm. because it's such a bright-sided world where um, the real setup is that you get to choose happy. You can be happy if you want to be. If you set your mind to it, you can be happy. It doesn't matter what your circumstances are. And so that all sounds great. Like when everything's going well, I can say, I'm being positive. I have a positive mindset. I choose happy. I keep a gratitude journal. But then as soon as we just become regular humans again, right? We suffer and we bleed and we hurt each other and we're disappointed. Then all of a sudden the world comes crashing down on us. All the self-help authors are going to say, well, then that's your fault. You mm -hmm. must not be doing it right, right? And they make their money off of the whole idea that we we must not be doing it right. And so I wanted to like push against that and say, hold on a second. Maybe it's the case that these moods constitute what it means to be human and that we ought to look at them deeper instead of just by default kind of reject them and, you know, avoid them and be scared of them. And, you know, so, so my whole book is like about leaning into them and thinking about them and, and staying there for, for a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I love the idea of this and it's making me think about how, you know, you mentioned that it's contextual and it really is a, if we think about the medical model and how it applies to mental health, we've pathologized a whole host of emotional experiences. They're labeled as a disorder. If somebody is feeling grief for a prolonged period of time, it's a disorder. Um, I, I feel like we need to revisit the way we do that, that there has to be another way that still allows us to help people that, that want to say like, I don't want to feel this way anymore. I'd like to feel different uh, because it's affecting me in this, this, in this way. Can we do that without, you know, we can still have that category to understand it because we know categorizing things helps us to understand and make sense of our world, but can we do it without the pathology? Yeah. I mean, if you think I've I've made lists of the words that we use for, you know, just general mental illness or things, I mean, mental illness is one of them. Disorder, dysfunction, deficiency, disease, pathology, infirmity, ailment, malady, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we don't speak nicely as a society. We don't speak nicely about human moods. We speak very nicely about joy and pleasure and, and all these things, but we don't speak nicely. And so there are, you know, that self-help book about like how to talk nicer to yourself or what to say when you're talking to yourself. There's lots um, projected onto the individual, right? Like you're not speaking nice to yourself. You should be kinder to yourself. And I want to take the heat off of the individual. I want to say, hold on. It's not me who's decided that I have a deficiency, that I'm broken. It's actually society that has told me in all these words that I'm dysfunctional. And so I want to get society, like I'm a philosopher, so I'm doing a social critique. I'm not just doing sort of um, psychology on the individual. I'm trying to push it back and say, what in our world is making us talk, not, you know, not nicely to ourselves? It's all the billboards. It's all the things that, you know, um, like... Uh, sort of attack me when I go into the to the airport I see a, a woman whose shirt says stay positive and I see a sign that says it will get brighter optimism pass it on right there's so much messaging that says if you're not doing this if you're not in this space 
then you're broken. And that's mm. what I'm calling, like there's a dichotomy in the book or, or a kind of like parallel structure where there's the light metaphor, which is everything will get brighter, bring your own, shine your own light, bring your own sun, love and light, the light at the end of the tunnel. It's it's related to make today ridiculously amazing as though these things are just solely within our power. Like bring your own sunshine, right? The world may be breaking around you, but you can still, you should still have a great day. So that's like the light metaphor. Every time we say that something is bright and brilliant and, you know, um, light, we're saying that anything dark is gross and ignorant and dangerous and ugly, and mm -hmm. we should ignore it, avoid it, suppress it, get rid of it. And so mm -hmm. then I think, well, I'm an existentialist. So I just think we are pretty dark, right? We're just humans, right? We're, we have some light in us and we have some dark in us. And, and if that's the setup, where only the light parts of us are celebrated and deemed kind of human and good, then all of a sudden, when we're in a dark spot, what do we do, right? Then all, all we have, right? Society's just basically telling us, now's the time you feel bad about yourself. Now's the time that you feel like you haven't done what all the self-help authors do, all the YouTubers, all the people who say, I got myself off my feet, I changed my life and you can too. And so it's a, I don't know, like I've gotten mixed messages about whether it's a particularly American, US American phenomenon. I've definitely mm -hmm. seen it in Mexico. Um, I don't know about Europe. I feel like maybe the the English are a little more um, pessimistic or something, but I don't know, you know, but, but certainly in this country, I feel like we are tormented by all the signs that say bless and that like tell us how to how to live, how to feel, and how mm -hmm. to make our day. And I feel like it's like walking into Target is 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 difficult for me because I see all the things that say whether it's a pillow or a coffee mug or a sign, and people willingly hang this stuff in their house. And I think, oh, that stuff's dangerous. Like I don't <laughs> I don't want to hang that in my house because I've already failed. Like my mm -hmm. my kids' soccer coach wears a shirt that says hashtag no bad days. And I think, oh my God, like I already failed. I've, I failed like when I was born, yeah. I already had bad days. Like none at all, zero. Like our mm -hmm. tolerance for dark moods is basically at a zero. And so I just think, okay, can I elevate that with this little book? Can I get us to be a little more realistic about what it means to be a human being, which is dark and light, happy and sad, often at the same time, a whole bunch of bittersweet. I like what Susan Cain is doing. Right. Like just like the mix, the the fullness of a human being is not never going to be just all bright and love and light and bring your own sunshine. We're never going to be that. So we have to figure out a way to um, talk nicer as a society about these moods that I consider to be just thoroughly human. I I agree. I do a lot of work with teens and they already espouse that, well, that anger is a bad emotion. It's, I'm not supposed to feel angry or it's, I'm bad if I feel, feel angry. And so if our children are already espousing that mindset, right, they've already integrated all of those uh, messages that you were talking about from various environments, whether it's like going to Target or just the messages that they hear at school, at home, it's all around television. Um, ha, like that is, ah, oh, that's painful. That's painful because then they are setting themselves up to be in a, a more pathologized state because now they're questioning like, well, that if I'm bad, then it starts taking them to really scary thoughts um, and they're not seeing their value in the world. They're not seeing that they matter because they are exploring and feeling these really painful, difficult feelings, but that are essential to our human experience, right? The idea that we're supposed to feel happy or we're, we're supposed to feel joyful all the time doesn't make any sense. Feelings are cyclical. They come and go. and I think, you know, the, the, the deep dark stuff teaches us so much about what it means to be human. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up anger because part of what I'm trying to do in the book is show where we got our opinions from. Where did we get these like sort of real knee jerk 
reactions, default assumptions that it's wrong. And so I talk about ancient Stoicism, which is super popular today. And it's fascinating because I find it completely dangerous. <laughs> um, it's a dangerous philosophy to play with because their whole idea was that you cannot feel things. You can make yourself stop feeling things that you don't want to feel. And um, most, like, I don't know a lot of people who actually believe that, but their idea was feelings are judgments and judgments are optional. And that that's all through certain kind of um, psychologies that we learn about today. But so so they they were the the harshest on anger. They were like, you shouldn't feel it. You can actually stop yourself from feeling it. Even if you're feeling it, you're already in the wrong. If you're feeling it, you're already weak. Then comes mm. Aristotle, who's like, wait, 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 wait. It's okay to feel it because feelings are just feelings. It's okay to feel angry. Just don't act on it. And so he was like a little bit nicer, but I, I tell a story in the book of like having kids like threw that all out the window for me because I would yell at them, right? I would behave badly and I would be like, okay, now am I just a monster? I'd look in the mirror and be like, I am the worst mom. I'm a monster because I'm a philosopher and those are the things I was brought up on. And even if you're not a philosopher, you either believe that you shouldn't get angry. So if you ever say, I'm sorry, I got angry. That means mm -hmm. you're with the Stoics and you believe you actually have a choice in whether you get angry or not. If you find yourself ever saying, I'm sorry, I acted out of anger, then you're more Aristotelian. You believe it's okay to feel angry, but I shouldn't have acted out of anger. And both of those during the pandemic, when everyone was smushed on top of each mm -hmm. other, went out the window. And so I thought, what if we re-educate ourselves on anger coming from contemporary theorists? of color. And so in the chapter, I talk about Bell Hooks, her theory of mm -hmm. anger, Maria Lugones, her. her theory of anger, and Audre Lorde. And if Seneca, the ancient Stoic, is saying um, anger's poison, anger is demonic, Audre Lorde is like, hey, what, you know what? Anger's information. Anger is useful to us. Mm -hmm. Anger is a tool with which we can excavate honesty. But as if, like, you're the kids you work with, if what they say is I'm angry, therefore I'm bad, they are never going to listen to their anger. Yeah. But Lord wanted us to listen to it. So as if we're knee jerk reacting against it by default saying that's bad. I shouldn't be like that. Like I did for most of my life. I'm angry person. I'm bad. And it's like, no, no, hold on. Maybe, maybe it's justified. Yeah. Maybe I'm angry about something. And so I started to use the, them as, as a help for me to retrain my brain to think about anger as information. Give it a chance. You might not be right. You might be, you know, in the wrong, like I often am with my kids, but sometimes I'm right. And sometimes I'm trying to make a, a space for myself to exist in a tradition in which the mother is supposed to not exist, right? The mother is supposed to disappear, be all self-sacrificing, et cetera. So some of my anger was justified, right? So the whole point is just not to deny it or reject it out of hand, but to actually give it a chance. And that means we have to sit in it. We can't will it away. We put, I don't think we should be counting to 10 and getting over it and forget about it. Because as soon as I calm down, all the advice, calm down, calm down. As soon as I calm down, I'm like, oh, no big deal. Oh, it was, a, I don't know what I was so upset about. No big deal. And I just think, oh, you've lost your fury. You've lost the, the fire, the heat. You've lost the thing that actually could help you make change mm -hmm. um, or at least articulate the thing. And, you know, ancient philosophers and a lot of us today believe, well, you're, when you're angry, you're not articulate. You can't, you're not, you're never speaking rationally. You're not saying what you actually believe. Audre Lorde and Maria Lugones specifically says, I have seen women with an outrageously clear head when they're angry. Because mm -hmm. what happens when you're so angry is you stop caring what people think of how you look. You stop self-monitoring and you actually say the truth. And so sometimes, like I've changed my opinion on that. It's, you know, sometimes I'm inarticulate when I'm angry and sometimes I'm very articulate. Sometimes I might be getting at the exact thing that has been bothering me. And so it's important to stay with it. It's important not to just be scared of it or get rid of it out of hand. Um, I would say, especially for women, like who have been trained to kind of swallow it and internalize mm -hmm. it and, you know, all this kind of thing. And so anyone who's been socialized that way is the point to, to kind of realize that this can be a tool. This can be helpful. This doesn't have to be scary. 
this can be something that you sit with and really try to learn from rather than just call it unladylike and try to get rid of it. Yeah, I I try my best with the kids to teach them that every emotion has a function and a purpose and a reason. There's a reason why we're feeling it. We might not understand the reason, like, why am I feeling this way? You don't need to know why, but how can you use it? How can, how can you listen and see what it has to tell you? What is it telling you in this moment? Usually anchors, uh, it's about, we've been threatened in some way, whether that is psychologically, socially, physically, um, or somebody we love and care about or something that we love and care about, something that's important to us has been threatened by somebody else. And we're, we're responding with anger because it is a motivating uh, emotion. It, and it gives us a lot of energy. I always tell people when they're, if you're feeling depressed and now you're feeling angry, Hey, that's good. You have more energy to do something now. Cause if we're feeling depressed, we we're in that like apathetic state and we don't have a lot of energy to do much. So when it shifts, let's take advantage of it. It can be quite energizing. Yeah. No. Yeah. So the other, the other one that I think has, so, so the bookends are anger and then anxiety is at the other end of the book. And, and the advice for both from, from these philosophers who are existentialists, who I sort of, I turn to now instead of the ancient philosophers who sort of, I feel like led me to feeling like I was bad, right? Shame, mm -hmm. um, feeling bad about feeling bad. And so with anxiety, Soren Kierkegaard says, also listen to it, listen to it. And I think that if we have a knee-jerk reaction against anxiety to say, anxiety is clinical, anxiety is a bad thing, anxiety is a deviation from what's human, then we have Kierkegaard, in my ear at least, right, saying, anxiety makes us higher than the animals and the angels. He says, if, he says the more anxious a society, the more profound that society. And I just think, oh my goodness, this is crazy, right? This is like nothing we hear. Everything we hear is about how anxiety is irrational or it's a brain disease or um, it's a chemical imbalance or it's a set of limiting beliefs, et cetera. And Kierkegaard comes in and he says, well, maybe it's a sign of emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. Maybe, what if we try on? for a while, for 20, 50 years. The idea that anxiety is emotional intelligence, that the anxious person's right. And we don't think so much about what, right? Because they might be wrong about the exact thing. It might not be, you know, the person going for a car ride and, and they're anxious that they're gonna die or something, right? It might not be that acute thing that they're right about, but, Anxious people are super attuned to the world in a way that I wouldn't necessarily want to dull out the world. I don't want, I think of it like, so I'm following like Rollo May and um, Irving Yalom in thinking that it's like a fire alarm, right? It's, it's telling us something. And so it's worth our while to listen to it rather than have this kind of, it's just like a cloud. Imagine it floating away. Like there's so much advice about how to get out of it or in, in the book, I talk about this book for kids about your anxious spot and you have to calm your anxious spot and make a circle on your hand until the anxiety goes away. And, and I just think, okay, what if we do the opposite, right? What if we, not totally the opposite, right? But what if we think of anxiety differently? What if we think of anxiety not all as clinical anxiety, mm -hmm. right? Because for me, there seems to be something, if 30% of Americans are clinically anxious, I just think like, everything has gone off the rails. Like I, either that's not possible or it's not true or our, our definition of clinical anxiety has gotten so bloated or something. And so, or we have a zero tolerance, right? If, if, if the standard is zero anxiety, right? Keep calm and carry on. Those messages freak me out mm -hmm. because then I think, oh, what am I supposed to be worried about? Why, why is there a sign telling me to keep calm it's because something terrible is happening and just open your phone and like 60,000 terrible things are happening. Mm -hmm. So we're not wrong to be anxious. We're right to be anxious. And so trying to turn it off or doing everything we can to turn it off or just assuming that it's the enemy, that that's the thing that's makes us broken. It's like, no, that's the thing that makes us human. That 
let's investigate it, right? I'm not broken because I'm anxious. I am attuned. I like the way Glennon Doyle puts it. She says, anxiety means that you're paying attention. Yeah. Right? So what if we just like turn our ideas about it a bit, you know, however much you feel comfortable with to sort of say, what if this isn't the big, bad, you know, thing that, that, that it's been made out to be. And what if we can up our tolerance of it in terms of society, not the individual. Again, I'm not prescribing much to the individual because I think we've been hurt enough by different industries trying to make us feel broken. But it's like, as a society, if we could just have more tolerance, like I'd love to see shirts that are like, yeah, a bunch of bad days or, um, you know, <laughs> like, like, like mediocrity, like life is okay. You know, like some good days, some bad days, like mm -hmm. just lower the bar for our emotional existence. And then I think, ironically, I think we'd actually see less anxiety and less of all this, because the more you're trying to tell people like, calm down, you're fine. Then the more we're like, oh, oh something's very <laughs> wrong. And, and so like, instead of listening to ourselves, we begin to sort of listen to a world that tells us we shouldn't feel so much. We shouldn't wear a heart on our sleeve. We shouldn't be so emotional, et cetera. And so mm -hmm. I'm just trying to like defend the individual against a society that sort of pressures us to just conform and, 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 and to, to have a kind of a negative viewpoint of our own moods that may, may in certain cases be trying to tell us something. I, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, there's, there's a reason that we experience emotions that we're that way by design um, so the idea that we're not supposed to, we're only supposed to feel some of them, uh, and not the others just doesn't make one. sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So how does this relate to some of, um, I would say the, the theories out there pertaining to the way we practice mental health, psychology, counseling, social work, et cetera. So um, I think I think it is on two levels. Like one, one it, it relates to the theories and that I'd like to maybe get into. But the second one is, as y'all who are listening are probably therapists, I think that a lot of what the relationship with a client looks like will depend on how you think about these moods, right? What are your assumptions or what's your education on grief? What, what, it, what are your inherent beliefs, right? Learned, of course, learned beliefs about anxiety because that's certainly going to affect the person you're working with. And likewise, like, you know, I'm writing in the book that who you choose. So, so A, I'm not anti-psychiatry at all in any way. And I'm certainly not anti-therapy, right? Like, I think these things can be helpful mm -hmm. um, using the case of anxiety. The whole point is to get it to a manageable volume. Like when the, when I experience anxiety, it is such a powerful noise in my head that I can't think, right? I cannot mm -hmm. access anything else. So I would think that meds or therapy is, is there to help me lower it, not get rid of it, right? Because if I get rid of it, I've just thrown away the thing that might help me figure out what's my next move in life, why I'm deeply upset, like, like the deeper things, the existential mm -hmm. issues about love and fear and death and all the things that I think are worth thinking about. And so I think that these, any kind of interventions are for the purpose of lowering the volume, not turning it off. But what I write about in the chapter on anxiety is if you're looking for a therapist, if if you if you're gonna find a therapist who says that all anxiety is bad and we should get rid of it, which may just be a made up person, right? Like maybe nobody believes that anymore. Um, then you're gonna get a very different type of therapy, right? You're gonna get a different experience, and you're gonna think differently about your own anxiety versus if you get someone like you know existential psychotherapists. I think who, you know, are sort of out of fashion now, but who would have a more um, holistic view or like a kind of like, let, like, let's be willing to go there. Like let, we can, we can hit these very, very difficult things. It's not a five week thing where you're gonna, you know, get rid of that anxiety in, in six weeks or whatever. Um, so that's the overall kind of like the, the, the relationship, I think, between the practitioner and the person who's, you know, dealing with 
their anxiety. But in terms of the theories, I was just so, um, I guess, disturbed by the popularity of positive psychology, for one. And I, I understood it. Like, I was definitely, like, sort of on the train of, like, we don't want everything to be a pathology. We want to notice all the strengths, and we want to, like, focus on gratitude. And, and I think Seligman is the king of positive mm -hmm. psychology, and I just find him extremely problematic because as a U.S. American, I think he tends to conflate optimism with positive thinking. And I think those are very different. And I think that like he talks about being grumpy and I'm like, grumpiness is not what you're trying to get at in positive psychology. So he slips and slides through the mood to like the affect of like, you should be smiling or you should be happy. And it's like, wait a second, that's not what positive psychology is supposed to be like. But the whole point is again, like, what do you think about this mood? So I talk about positive psychology in the chapter on pain, just emotional pain, sadness, right? So if you believe that, like he does, that you have like these limiting beliefs, right? That these are the things that are getting in your way. He, he's talking about a woman who, um, who was out of the workforce for 10 years, tries to get back in or like wants to get back in, talks to her husband about it. And she's a negative warrior and he's like the positive champion. And he's like, you can get a job. You just have to have to have the right attitude and you don't know how great you are. And let me tell you all your, you know, um, skills and whatever. And let's brainstorm. And she's like, no, nah, I just don't think they're going to want me. Who would want me after 10 years? I'm old, blah, blah, blah. So she looks like the one who is broken. And he looks like the one who's great. And that's precisely the way that Seligman interprets it. He's like mm. championing this guy. He's like, he's got a better explanatory style and he's an optimist, right? And he's really trying to convince her to believe in herself. And that is like super common today. That kind of thing where the champion is the one who's the good one. And the, the kind of negative one is the one who's painted as like, oh, you you no one can make you happy. You just want to be negative, right? With that attitude, you're never going to get that job. This kind of like blame the person who is already suffering. Mm -hmm. And so what it just bothered me so much when I read that story years and years ago that I was like, what if she's right? Like, what about being out of the workforce for 10 years, taking care of your kids makes you like a prime candidate for going back into the workforce. Why do we believe that it's just a matter of the will? Like if mm -hmm. you just have the positive attitude, then you're going to get that job. I actually think that this woman, Jody, had a better explanatory style. He called her a brooding pessimist. I'm like, I don't think she's a brooding pessimist. I think she's right. I think she's wow. absolutely rational which is one of the things you say against people. You say you're being irrational. I think she was actually more rational. I think the guy was wishful thinking. I think he was full of these ideas of like, oh, if you just, you know, mind over matter or like bring it into being, choose happy. You can make your dreams come true. Like all the way, you know, kind of down into manifestation talk. So I just feel like I want to defend her and say, hold on a second. Let's like, forget her affect. Her affect may be like Eeyore and like, mm -hmm. but like the point is she's right. Could the husband treat her like maybe she was being rational, maybe she's the right one, and he needs to start learning how to listen, because what she's saying is actually quite informative, and she's trying to communicate with him. Mm -hmm. And so the whole idea, back to sort of your, your actual question, is like, if we believe that being pessimistic, or that sort of having a negative affect or worrying or being sad if we if we believe that those are inherently kind of counterproductive or limiting then we are limited we are limited in our ability to actually talk to that person because as long as we think well i'm going to cheer you up i'm going to make you feel better i'm going to make you feel like you can go out there and conquer the world then we are the ones who are poor we are like poor on emotion we're emotionally anemic because we're unable to like step into that space and say wait a second here she is in this spot Mm -hmm. Can I get there? What can I do? Um, and this is what I want to talk more about at the summit is how to step into sadness to meet other people there instead of trying to bring them out. So mm -hmm. my metaphor is like the dark and we bring in flashlights. We Like they're in a cave. Jody's in this dark cave and we're like, eh, let me make you feel better. What can I get you? You know, let's go out for ice cream. And he brings her flashlights. And I'm like, he doesn't need to bring her flashlights. He just needs to know how to get to her. And she's trying to help him get to her by giving him this little string with words to say, this is what I'm worried about. And he's like, oh, his hands are full of flashlights. So he can't find her in the dark because he's so busy thinking it's his job 
to take her out of the dark and put her into the light. So that's mm. the, that's one thing. So, so positive psychology has like, for me, like it, it's, it's, it's dangerous in the way that it's not wrong. It's not bad. It's not awful. It's like dangerous to play with. Like we have to be super careful in what we mean when we're just trying to focus on, on all these, you know, the gratitude and the whatever, the positive thinking. So, and I know it's not a synonym for positive thinking, but there's a lot of overlap in terms of how we think about negativity, how we think of it as kind of limiting and bad, where, whereas it actually could be quite informative for us. And the other one is, is CBT, which mm -hmm. sometimes overlaps with positive psychology, but I find CBT to be very problematic and not just because some practitioners take it off the rails. That's not it. It's like in the very literature, at least like CBT one, um, the very literature talks about limiting beliefs, negative thinking, ineffective behavior patterns. And I think it also, um, it, it takes on the stoic tone of like, it's not your current situation that you're upset about. It's your beliefs about your situation. Mm -hmm. And I want to say, no, often it's just our situation. <laughs> like, I don't want to put it on the individual to say, okay, you may be um, I mean, stoicism was really like, it works best in a jail. It works best when you actually have no options, when you are like stuck and you cannot change your situation and, and you can't change your situation like from the outside, from the inside, there's nothing you can do. Then yes, there's ways to make peace and to like accept fate and kind of live with what you have. But I don't want to give up. I find it a very defeatist kind of thing. I want to change the world. I want to make the world more just for people who are oppressed. I don't want to just be like, well, how can I make my um, beliefs, you know, more palatable or more uh, accepting of the situation I have going on? I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to default to thinking that I'm upset because my beliefs upset me. I want to more consider that I'm upset because the world is unjust. I'm more okay with that. And so at least to, um, to explore that, right? So that's an interesting, it's just an interesting kind of things that I'm like wary of from both from ancient philosophy, but also a very, very contemporary ways of looking at these dark moods. I think that they have something in common and something to be sort of questioned and, and maybe reconsidered. Yeah, I, I hear a lot of what you're saying in terms of, you know, beliefs. It can be very difficult to change a belief when there's so much evidence supporting why it exists in the first place. And particularly when we're talking about people that have multiple barriers to kind of get to the same playing field as myself and my white counterparts, um, it's very difficult. That's a very difficult ask. And, you know, to your point, how much harm is that causing for that individual to say like, yeah, right. Sorry. Change your belief and you change your life, but their life is very, very different from my life because of all of the advantages that come with having white skin in a world in the United States, especially, um, where there's so much, there's so, uh, the prevalence of um, racism and oppressive systems that have been put in place for hundreds of years um, that are, are still in place. Even our, our schools have uh, oppressive practices for our kids. Um, it's, not, it's not a fair ask to ask that of someone. Yeah. And like the, the irony is that I think it works a lot of the time. So, so here's the thing, here's the setup that I have, like an individual can go into therapy and come out feeling better about their situation that is still unjust, right? That has not changed one bit. And so, um, but what I'm, what I don't want is to see every individual who is oppressed go into therapy to learn how to accept their situation. Right. Like the world will actually never change if we're just like, well, I have a personal problem. This is an individual personal thing that I have to learn how to deal with. It's like, no, wait a second. Why can't we turn it around? It's almost like we're all saying, well, the world's not going to change. You know how it is. 
you know, and it, it is like, I have this odd optimism about the world that like, I'm like, no, let's take it on because I actually think we can change it as long as we stop saying it's your problem. You have a problem. I'm like, no, no, I'm reflecting a problem that is prevalent in society. Mm -hmm. So I don't necessarily want to become more like accepting of my situation. Like that just sounds sad to me, even though it might make me feel better then like the things aren't going to change. And I'm not saying that it's up to the people who are in that situation to change it. I'm saying like, it's up to all of us to change it. Mm -hmm. But the whole point, if it's just to make me feel better, then the systems will remain whatever they were before. As long as we're seeing it as an individual problem with your limiting beliefs, like, wait a second, um, aren't these all of our, like, isn't this isn't this a shared experience for many of us? So, So what would happen if we can empower people to say, you know what, you're right. Like, yeah. like just on a lot of these things, what if we just tried on the idea that we're not wrong, that we might be right? Like what would change? I, I think that, um, I think that in time, our society can change if we begin by opening ourselves up to the very fact that these moods don't make us broken. Yeah. I, I appreciate that, um, expression and intention for empowerment. If we can empower somebody, to make change. And if we're all working to that effect, then we can change the systems. We need to change the systems because the systems are not working. They're not working well. As somebody who's been practicing therapy for 20 years, our systems are really messed up. Uh, they're not working well. They're not as effective as they need to be. And part of it is relates to exactly what you're talking about as to why. Um, and of course, just other oppressive practices that exist in the world that have nothing to do necessarily with, you know, therapy and psychology, but it it's the business. It's the business of it that is really broken. And that impacts people too, because then they go, well, I've, I'm reached out for help because I've been told there's something wrong with me, right? I have to change so that I can fit in and be okay in the world. And now I'm trying to access care and I can't get it anywhere. It's, it's messed up in so many directions. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what do you propose for, like, how do we, what can we do? um at all of us what's like one little thing we can all do to make these changes to start to shift the systems it's kind of an outward and an inward like the outward thing i would like everyone to do is be a little more critical of the signs of you know what we're seeing in our world kind of read the walls of our society and see what it's trying to get us to do or feel or whatever. So just to like see things. Um, and then on an inner, in, in our inner worlds to try this night vision, right? To try to see in the dark, to try not to put a light on as soon as we feel uncomfortable, to try to sit a little bit more with it. And there's caveats for depression um, and, and, you know, people have limits and all this, right. It's not an all or nothing. This is the hard thing about my book is that it can easily get misunderstood as like, oh, your depression is your superpower. The five, the gifts of your dark moods. I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying like, we have them. They're already here. They've already landed on our doorstep. I don't care whether you call it a gift or not. I don't need that. Like nobody, you don't need to call it a gift to try to say like, maybe there's something here that I need to be listening to. Maybe this is a form of self. I mean, Audre Lorde calls anger self-care. Mm -hmm. Not Audre Lorde, Maria Lugones. But like, oh my God, how can anger be self-care? Like if we could just open our mind a little bit to, you know, be kinder to ourselves, knowing that it's not us who created these poisonous stories or these like, um kind of ugly stories about our moods it's not us we didn't we're not to blame it's like the world has has tried to the world tells us to feel bad about ourselves and then when we do they're like why are you feeling so bad <laughs> right and it's like i just want to get more critical and be like yeah look at that look at that look at all these forces in our world that sort of thrive on us feeling bad 
and then feeling bad about feeling bad, right? That that mm -hmm. that juncture of shame of just like, oh, here here we've got you in a great place because then you will never advance, you'll never turn against the world, you'll just think you're messed up, right? So mm -hmm. in the book, I try to say it like succinctly and say like instead of thinking there's something wrong with me, I want I would like everyone to say, okay, there's something wrong, and stop yeah. there, right? And not it immediately default to like I must be messed up I must be ill I must be broken like maybe there's just something wrong in the world and it doesn't mean we're going to fix everything but it certainly means we can stay on our own side that's what I want for us is to stay on our own side take our own side not become our own enemy as I am so so want to do right just to say well it's me you know Taylor Swift says it best right I'm the problem it's me and I just think she's a philosopher and she doesn't even know it <laughs> um, but it's like, that's our temptation. It must be me. If something's wrong, I must have done something wrong. I didn't choose happy. That's why I'm in the dumps. So, mm. yeah. And we all know that there are real and true and valid reasons for feeling sad, for feeling anger, for, for feeling bereft. And, and I think for grief itself, you know, so many people attribute it to, well, I lost a person or I lost um, a pet, you know, I, I lost a friend, but there are so many other ways that we grieve. We grieve a loss of our hopes. We leave grieve loss of dreams that were unfulfilled, um, all kinds of losses that warrant that feeling of grief and we need to make space to feel it. I I think the only way out is through. We have to feel our way through them. The more we avoid the feeling, the bigger that feeling is going to get. And the the stinkier it's going to be when it finally does come out. Um, so. Yeah, the world is particularly harsh on grievers. Like, it is. It's it's twice like the grief is probably just fine if the world would change and allow it, but because the world tries to push us out of grief, then we have to grieve uh, secretly when no one's looking and we can't talk about it. Like it's incredible how grievers suffer doubly just because of our world. Like it's hard enough to lose a person or even what you're saying, right? Right for things that you can't even point to, that's even harder to explain to someone. And they just want you to be happy. We just want everyone to be happy. And I think we need to radically rethink that because it's too it's too one-sided it's too lopsided it's it's unrealistic right like mm -hmm. we need to just you know take it down a notch and just create some better language for what we want for each other and ourselves because the happily ever after the like okay now now I'm good like that doesn't exist so <laughs> right yeah, yeah. Uh, there's so much here to this topic. Um, I feel that's valuable for not only other therapists, but for all of us to make space to allow for and to be okay with having emotions, whatever they are. I think just to be able to cry, to cry when that feeling comes, you know, some pe people are like, I can't cry. I don't want to cry. If I cry, then I'm weak or, you know, I, there's no room for tears. We have so many things about, you know, I'll give you kids hearing from their parents. I'll give you something to cry for, right. Is like a big one. Um, and crying is, a, is an essential function. Um, I want to live to see the day where nobody says, I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional. Oh, because that's, that's purely stoic, right? I can stop it. I, I am sorry, right? This thing is inappropriate. I am sorry. I am putting, we, nobody says, I'm sorry. I'm laughing, but <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm getting emotional. I'm sorry. I'm crying. What? We are crazy. Like that the world is just really lopsided, right? Like it, it mm -hmm. is super messed up and we need to just, especially in raising boys, I think like the crying thing is particularly terrible but also for girls like all just everybody is discouraged you just shouldn't cry that's what we yeah. tell people like wow you're just turning off the thing that is actually going to help me right yeah I I totally agree I'm I'm a crier I cry wherever um it strikes it happens and um I prefer 
to just let it happen. Cause if I don't, then I know I'm going to be feeling, I'm going to be feeling way worse than if I just allow myself to move through the process, whatever it is and however long it takes. Um, and sometimes it takes a long time, depending upon the situation, the life scenario. I'm jealous of criers. <laughs> jealous it's hard when you can't when you like it's like I'll, I'll strain for every tear I'll be like oh thank god I got one because it does help but the thing that I've heard that I also would love to never hear again is um if I start crying I'll never stop mm-hmm. and I just think have you analyzed that like is that a critical point of view or did you just like hear that somewhere I don't think that has ever happened I don't think that's actually a phenomenon I know what you mean when you say that but that's not what happens when you cry and so the point is, I think, to, you know, not not just be 100% against it. Like, my point is so modest, right? I'm not saying, like, go in the cave, stay there forever, only feel dark moods. I'm like, can we just not default to thinking that all the dark moods are terrible? Yeah. Can we try to think that maybe they have, they're part of us, they have something, you know? Mm-hmm. So. They have, they have a lot to offer really. If we're, if we're willing to explore them and to be with them and spend time with them, they have a lot to offer. The the real point of my book is in fact, not even about defending the moods themselves, because I don't care as much about moods as I care about people. The, The point of my book is to defend the people who experience those moods. I don't want to hear people being talked about as broken. Mm -hmm. So it's the person, it's not like, here's the reason why your, you know, um, grief is good for you. It's to say, no, no, you already are grieving and it probably sucks, but you're not broken. There's, you're Mm -hmm. not wrong, right? Like you're not messed up. That's what grief looks like in some people, right? So it's the person I'm trying to defend, not really the mood. Although, you know, like you said, all these moods do have a little something and that's what I'm trying to tease out in the book. But Mm -hmm. even if you kind of scrap that, it's to say, like, we're not trash, you know, and I've learned from my college students, a lot of them just think of themselves as trash, right? Because if it weren't for my depression, if it weren't for my anxiety, then I'd be an okay person. And they want to trash the mood. And I'm like, if you trash the mood, you're trashing the whole human. So like, I don't want you to trash either one. Like, so it's for me, it's just a given that we live with these. And so now what? It's not to say, let's try to seek them out or that suffering is good for you or any of that kind of mistakes that people kind of get into philosophically. It's just to say, we have these moods. Can we think of ourselves other than as broken? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, Because clearly it's just, it's biology. It's part of the human phenomenon, being human comes with like anxious having people aren't worse than non-anxious people that's that's like a, a, a premise that I want to you know really enforce like we're not worse than people who aren't anxious we're not less human yeah. Kierkegaard says we're more human I don't need to get into a debate about whether we're better or worse than other people it's just the fact that like we're not less hum- we're not like docked points on humanity because we live with certain moods that are really difficult and painful yeah that yeah they are difficult and painful. And, um, and yet I think life is difficult and painful. (laughs) There's so many things that like you pointed out, every time you look on the look in the news or read the newspaper, there's so many difficult, difficult experiences that we go through. And along with that, we experience different moods, different feelings and feelings, feelings just are, are, just as much a part of the human physiology as our heart beating and our stomach digesting food. I feel like if we could think about, think about that in a different way of like, it's just part of the process. No. Yes. Well, where can people find your book? Um, Anywhere you get books. So it should be in all the bookstores. Um, you can get it online. Um, you can order it from a bookstore. This is what people don't know. They like go to the bookstore and if it's not there, they're like, oh, it wasn't there. And I'm like, you can order it. Like if you live in a place, you can ask them to buy it and then they will get it. Uh-huh. And then you go get it. It's very quaint, like a real, you know, kind of old school bookstore. But a lot of bookstores already have it. So I've heard of people sort of saying, oh, I just picked it up, you know. Um, but you can also get it on the, the A word. 
Oh, <laughs> the big place. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, and I have a website, marianaalessandri.com, and an Instagram, mariana.alessandri. So you're you're welcome to follow me. I mean, I don't post, you know, um, happy, fun, exciting, gratitude things. I post things that I'm feeling and and that other people are feeling, and I'm you know trying to take the temperature. And I think some people find it a relief, and then for others, it's not for them, and that's okay, right? Like, mm -hmm. if it's for you, you know, join me. Uh, and if not that's okay too. Like that's just sort of the world I live in. And, and I've talked to enough people that kind of live in the same world that feel badgered by positivity, that it's like, there's enough of us to merit a little community, whether online or at the summit or whatever, to be like, oh, let's talk about how the world is making us feel worse by trying to make us feel better, by trying to make us focus on the light. They actually make us feel worse because we just have bad days. Yeah, it it highlights the comparative, right? Like, okay, yeah, yeah, that sh divide. Um, it's the underbelly. Whenever someone's saying choose happy, and you're not, then it's you. You <laughs> didn't choose it, right? It, it's the underbelly that necessarily accompanies every story of I did it, and so can you. Well, I didn't, so I guess I'm not as motivated <laughs> as you. You know? No, I. I hear you. I think that but I it... still go back to self-help all the time. I'm reading a parenting self-help book. I love them. Like I love the pain. I love the pain of someone telling me you're doing it wrong. Here's how to do it right. And then I'll try it and then I'll get discouraged and I'll go to another one. Like it's also addictive, you know, but there is a sort of re-education that can happen knowing that like these people sort of, they're trying to help, but they also inadvertently make us feel bad. Mm -hmm. I think too, you know, it, it expresses itself in the mood but it expresses itself in other ways too, um, along the same line, the very like extremist kind of thinking that, that you have to do it this way. It is your responsibility to do it this way. And if you just took that responsibility, then X in your life would be different. Um, it's very American, like the bootstraps, like you can do this yourself. And I think like, whoa, there's a lot of luck involved in these self-help authors. There's a lot of luck involved in communities. There's there's roots, there's all kinds of things that made that thing possible, not just them white knuckling it into their own happiness. So I also mm -hmm. think there's binaries. Like, like I think a big complaint I have of the world is just, are you happy or are you sad, right? Are you this or are you that? Is it black or is it white? Are you good? No, I'm not good. Like, even how are you? I think it's just a setup. How are you? I don't know. I don't know. What do you mean? I don't know what the question means today, right now. Like, right. I don't know how to, how to answer that. It puts pressure on someone. So it's almost like I just now say, oh, it's good to see you. Right. Like mm. there's, there's all these like bent bends or biases toward, this is what you should answer. This is how you right. should feel. People just, just tell me you're good. Like, please don't, don't make a problem. Just tell me you're fine. Mm -hmm. Right. If so you say, yeah. okay, just okay. Yeah. You're yeah, just or what okay. If I, what if like in the grocery, I'm like, no, I'm actually not well. Then they'd be like, oh, I'm so sorry. And I'd be like, no, it's just every other day. Like what? It's just a day. <laughs> it's just Monday. Like, I don't, I don't know what you want. What do you expect of me? Like, why would I be better? What, why do we have these great expectations of our moods? You know, mm -hmm. I feel like it's perfectly fine to be just okay. I do too. Yeah. Or to be pissed off. Yeah. Or, right. Or to be deeply sad. Yeah. And so I would like to live in a world where we could say these things if we want to and and not say them if we don't feel like it, you know, but the, where they would be not so um, scary to people. <gasps> yeah. I don't yeah. Know. Like, yeah, it's true. Well, I, I appreciate you coming on and sharing about your work and your philosophy. And um, obviously, if folks want to hear more from you, they could sign up and attend your workshop um, speaking at the summit, which is November 16th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. And the title is Against Toxic Positivity, Embracing Sadness for Genuine Empathy, which you shared a lot about today. It's like, we don't have to change somebody's mood. We can just sit there and be there with them and experience it with them. And just say, yeah, you're not alone. I'm here. <laughs> and that's yeah. enough. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. Thank you so much for having me. It's been really fun to talk to you. 
Yeah, it's been fun for me as well. And I'll put all of your contact information, the website, um, where to find the book and a link for the summit in the show notes. So if listeners can't write it down, you can just go to the show notes and get that information and, and connect that way. So thank you. The book is also in like ebook and audiobook. People react differently when I say that. They're like your face. Yeah. People, <laughs> they're like, oh, I didn't know it was an audiobook. Like now maybe I'll get it. So if that changes anyone's mind, some people are like, I only listen to audiobooks. It is available. I'm not the reader, by the way. Um, I wasn't invited to, and that's okay. But there's a professional reader. She's an actress and she's wonderful. So oh, that's awesome. You get the audiobook, yes. Yeah, I do both, but I love audiobooks because it helps me to, um, I can get through the material uh, yeah. just the way life is. Like I can listen to it on a commute and, or if I'm traveling or if I'm going walking um, and that kind of thing. It just makes it well, easier. Gisela Chipe is the reader and she's great. So awesome. Yes. Happy reading. Happy listening. Well, thank you so much, Mariana, and uh, I appreciate the time that you spent today. Thank you so much. Therapist Podcast. We're grateful for your listenership. If you like the conversations that we share with you, please like, share, subscribe wherever you listen to. Uh, it helps us reach a greater audience who may also be interested in hearing about these conversations. And make sure to check out the Expressive Therapy Summit full range of uh, training and CEU opportunities uh, that they have for you, whether it is the virtual conference on the East Coast that's happening in November 2023, uh, where Mariana is going to be uh, talking and teaching, um, or it is one of their other options. Um, there's a Midwest option that's happening in Chicago. There's usually a uh, an option that happens on the West Coast out in California. And as I'm doing this recording, they're actually having one, a small one in Sedona, Arizona. It's the second one. I didn't get a chance to go last year and I got so overwhelmed this year that I didn't even realize it was happening until like literally uh, seeing somebody post about it on Facebook. Um, but that's one I really want to check out. Anyway, you can find more information about all of those offerings at www.expressivetherapysummit.com. There you'll be able to click on uh, virtual offerings or in-person offerings, and you'll find you know all the places that they're offering trainings. I uh, hope you check it out and enjoy. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Creative Psychotherapist. If you like what you heard, please rate, review, and subscribe wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. For show notes, downloads, and additional resources, head over to the website at www.creativeclinicianscorner.com.